right. Hey, good morning, everyone. Hey, so good to have you here at the 1030. Come in and grab your seats because uh, we are going to get started. Uh, now, we've had our 830 this morning, first morning where we've had two gatherings here in the Harp. How exciting. Uh, now, just so you know, we are actually live streaming this one here, 1030. So uh, good morning to all of those who are live streaming. Streaming from home. Uh, we've got a little camera down the back there as always. We turn around and give them a good wave. Like um, we've had two gatherings, but we do still obviously have a bunch of people who are tuning in from home. So good to have you join us as well. Uh, you know, it's been quite a journey, hasn't it, over the last few months? And then even this week, you know, uh, who knows what's going to happen? Things are changing all the time. And yet there is such a good thing to be able to gather together. And as people have been commenting, one of the best things about being able to gather together is actually being able to sing together. And so we're going to do that now. We're going to sing King of Kings. So let's all stand together and lift up our voices in praise to our King. Let's stand.
Grab a seat. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you indeed are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And Lord, you looked down upon your creation, and even though it had rebelled against you, Father, you, in your love, sent your Son to die for it and for us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for that. And as we do, continue to reflect on the God that you are in the way that you save. Might our eyes and our hearts be lifted up to you and might we be praising and encouraging each other towards what you have done for us at the cross. Amen. Well, I want to give a warm welcome to everyone again. Again, welcome to those on our live stream. My name is Manuel, one of the pastors here at Christ Central. Uh, we are going to be continuing on on our series through Exodus, which is uh, kind of like the prototype of God's saving redemption of his people in the Old Testament. Now, my like John taking up and preaching uh, for us this morning, uh, but now we've been having our Exodus videos here and uh, they are there for the kids to really engage with the story of the Exodus, but uh, let's be honest, adults, who is looking forward to the Exodus video every single week just to see what they've come up with? Yeah, I am too. Um, so this, ne this next uh, installment of our Exodus video so that we can enjoy part of the story and, and ourselves get into the story of the Exodus. again. Yeah. Pharaoh was scary. He was yeah, really he, scary. He really was scary. So at the end of last episode, God said to Moses to go back and talk to Pharaoh. Oh, I, yeah. Oh, I wonder if that's the same Pharaoh that was running after him trying to get him. Oh, if it is, that, that'll be really scary. Yeah, it would be really scary. But remember, God said that, that he would be with Moses. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, God must be pretty big and pretty awesome. Yeah, he sounds like it. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll just get the remote. All right. Okay, hit play. I'll turn it up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, let's sit back. Oh, episode oh. three. Whoa. Whoa. The time came for Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh and ask him to let God's people go. Pharaoh looked at them like they were dumb and said, I don't know the Lord your God, and I'm not going to let your people go. That I cannot do. In fact, Pharaoh really didn't want the Israelites to go anywhere. They were doing all the hard work, and if they left, who would make the bricks to build all his important buildings and palaces and pyramids? The Israelites cried out to Moses, help us. Moses said to God, why is all this happening? God heard Moses and told Moses to go to Pharaoh and ask again to let the people go. But Pharaoh said, No. God was about to show Pharaoh that he was the one true God. First, God turned Aaron's staff into a snake. But Pharaoh's magicians did the same. Except that Aaron's snake ate up the magician's snakes. But Pharaoh said, No. Next, God turned the river Nile into blood. La, no one could drink that water, and it stunk. But stubborn Pharaoh said, No. Then God sent frogs, millions of them. Pharaoh said, Ah! Yeah, nah. Next came gnats, flying bugs everywhere. But Pharaoh said, Blech. No! Then God sent flies. <laughs> they were everywhere. Pharaoh said, Yeah, nah. Then God struck down all the animals of the Egyptians. All of the Egyptian cows, sheep, goats, donkeys, horses and camels died. But he still said, No. 
Next, God sent painful sores to cover the Egyptians. But Pharaoh still said, No. Then there was hail from the sky that destroyed the Egyptian crops and everything in its path. But Pharaoh said, Yeah, nah. If Pharaoh thought flies were bad and annoying, then the plague of locusts was worse. These bugs ate all the Egyptian crops and trees and any plants they could find. Pharaoh said, Yeah, nah. Then God plunged the land into darkness. For three days, no one could see anything. Ow! Who left my chariot here? Ugh. What's this? Yuck! That's not my dinner. That's the cat food. But Pharaoh still said no. He would not let God's people go. How good! Hey, if you're enjoying those videos, let's give let's give the kids team a bit of encouragement and Josh and the production team. Because that's I'll tell you what I was getting into that story. Great. So uh, thanks, guys, for bringing that and encouraging all of us and getting all of us, uh, young and old, involved uh, in the story of the Exodus. All right, well, I'm going to invite you up now because, uh, you know, it's been, a, been, been quite a journey to get here. We have uh, our 10.30 and our 8.30 this morning, which is, which is great. Gunnar, how are you going? Yeah, going really well. And it's, uh, I'm seeing people here today that I have not seen in months. So how, how good is it to actually see people um, together like this today, yeah. Yeah, so this is obviously the first time, two, two gatherings here. I mean, just yes. tell us about that, 10.30, yeah, yeah. 8.30. Yes. Um, you know, the re reason we're doing 8.30, 10.30, first day of that is because we actually think meeting together is that important. We want to maximise the space that we're using here at the Hub, you know, to, to be able to do this. You know, we have been live streaming. We are continuing to live stream. And, um, but we just got to realise that live streaming only does so, so much. You know, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a make-do approximation of church um, but we just got to realize what's go going on as we you know as we live stream you know de definitely is a case that you know in terms of you know the culture and age we're in you know it sort of fits doesn't it because you know if you want to get groceries well you can just get it delivered delivered to your house if you want to uh, get restaurant food you get uber eats to your door if you want to uh, go and watch a movie you just get netflix you know at home and now you can even if you want church you can have it into your living room as well and so there's been you know there's blessings with that there's been some good things about that but in reality there's nothing like gathering together you know the the feedback i've got over our first three trial weeks is that people are going oh, i can actually focus and 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 you know and, and like i've never done before and really pay attention i think that's true um and i hope you sort of experience that if this is your first time at the hub today um, but, you know, we're gathering together, not just because it's sort of helpful and practical, but actually because it's essential. Um, that's what it means to be church. And, you know, reflect, you know, Hebrews 12, we're actually reflecting the realities of heaven as we gather together, as we gather around uh, God, the, the teaching, him, his word, uh, him, yeah, his word coming to us, um, us drawing to him in love and adoration and worship and that we might be even equipped to go out and live as his disciples and, his, and be his ambassadors in the world. So, yes, it's so good. It's so essential and important that we do gather like this. It's been, I mean, it's been a bit of an interesting week, hasn't it, Garner? I mean, yes. uh, you know, things are constantly changing, but in a sense, yes. I think there is people... We're sort of waiting to see what, what might come of this week, but yeah. there's definitely sort of that level of anxiousness about... Yeah, yeah there is. It? And, you know, we've been on this journey as a church, and, you know, I think the only thing we've realised we can ever plan for is that our plans will probably change and um, you know who knows what's going to be happening over the days and weeks ahead I think we're all watching the news we're wondering what might happen you know is community transmission really going to take off um, uh, you know and we face you know fears anxieties with that you know I just want to say when people feel anxious about that's real that's a real thing isn't it um, you know I just want to say that as a government uh, sorry as a church we're going to respond to government you know we actually we're not treating government's instructions to us as a church is an act of persecution or anything we're just responding just like any other organization um, in terms of how we might love one another and love our community uh, we can you know we can live stream but now we can even do this which is which is just you know which is what we want to do um, but I want to say you know we're, we're gathering together hand sanitizer socially distant you know morning tea is a bit different as well so it's all a little bit different but um, you know we're just going to keep being on this journey um, together just want to say as well, like if people are feeling anxious, we want to 
love one another um, uh, with that. Um, you know, we all face our own weaknesses and frailties. Let's be a community that actually loves one another in the midst of, I guess, what we're facing ourselves. And, you know, we're gathering like this. We're gathering in growth groups. That's an opportunity that we can actually really be uh, there for each other in relationships. So that's why we think our growth groups are really important. So talking about the plan and, and, and I mean, just tell us about the plan going forwards over the next few weeks now. Yes. Yeah, so... Um, Current plan is that we'll be here at the hub for two more weeks, 8.30, 10.30, um, and then the plan would be to move back to the hall. So we're just going to keep watching things and assess things as we go, but that's what we'd love to do. Um, just say as well, so what we're saying that with the space restrictions of the hub, we reckon we can fit you in at least two out of the three Sundays. So if you haven't yet, just, just book in for next Sunday. Let the following, the third Sunday, be the overflow week if, you, if people get in front of you and book ahead of time and we can't fit you. So let's sort of get into that habit of just weekly gatherings. want us to. So book in for next Sunday and, um, and then, yeah, and then on the 23rd of August, I think, is the day we'd love to be back in the hall. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Garnet. Yeah, uh, no worries. Kind of just get that update and, and, and where things are at. Um, now, uh, our Sunday morning gatherings aren't just aren't, aren't the only community that's going on. In fact, there's actually a whole bunch of things that we're planning to really make lots of different opportunities to actually gather together, different places, different group of people to, to, to be spending time together. So uh, we're actually going to see our, our next community video just to give us a, a bit of an, an out, outline of the plan of the, some of the things that are coming up over the next month. So let's tune your eyes up here. Hey, everyone. It's Michelle Ting here. Wait. It's Michelle Weber here. I still got to get used to that. I love that our church family is for all, young and old. The Exodus videos have been so good. Last weekend was really awesome to see all the kids come together again and they filmed the next section for the Exodus series. It was like being on a real movie set. Spoiler alert, I can't wait to see them cross the Red Sea. It was a really fun day and even the rain couldn't dampen their spirits. Anyway, we've got loads of awesome community stuff coming up this month in August. Next Sunday, 9th of August, is a picnic. And it's not just any picnic, but a picnic and a sports day. We're going to the Green in Castledine Village. You might know it as the place where they hold the Castledine Markets. There's a new park with the playground and football fields where we're going to hold our very first 8.30 versus 10.30 soccer match. Go 10.30. For the men, sadly, we've had to cancel the winter camp that was planned for the men in July. But instead, we're going to do a barbecue, bonfire and camp out at the Lannings Place from the 14th to the 15th of August. It's only 30 minutes drive north. Bring a tent, a camp chair and enjoy some good fireside chats and meat. There will be lots of meat. But don't worry, women, we're not going to miss out. On the 29th of August, we'll be getting together for high tea and an afternoon sharing stories of faith. That's a great way to spend an afternoon, if you ask me. For more information, contact Emily Andrews and let her know you're interested. So just to recap that briefly, our picnic and sports day is next Sunday. The men's camp out is the weekend after that and the women's high tea is on the 29th. As always, if you've missed anything, just check out the What's On section of our website at christcentral.org.au. And that's it from me. Have a great Sunday. Bye. All right, thanks, Michelle, for that update. Do I hear, do I hear a bit of a cheer for 10.30 there? Yeah, go like there, the 10.30 is, yeah. Um, that's going to be a lot of fun next week. All right, hey, we're going to spend a bit of time praying together. I think that's a great thing, another great thing to be doing as we gather together. So I'm going to hand this over to Dan, one of our young adults, who's going to lead us in that. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. We come now to a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a holy and all-powerful God. We give you thanks, for you have given us hope in an unshakable kingdom. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, you show us sinners in desperate need of rescue, undeserved mercy and compassion, and we are made holy in your sight. So we bring our worship to you in reverence and awe, for you deserve all the praise and glory. As we study your word in Exodus, 
We see your awesome glory revealed to your people. You did not forget your people, enslaved in a land they did not belong. Instead, you work to release them from their chains and work out the promise made to Abraham, a promise that we see fulfilled today in the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you also for Double Up with the senior youth on Friday night. We pray for the friends who came to that. May they consider the good news of Jesus that they heard. And may you work in their hearts to bring them to faith in Jesus. Lord, we pray now for comfort in what are uncertain times. False anxiety and fear may try to whirl. We pray that we will know certainty and peace through the eternal hope that you give us. May this be a characteristic that enables us to witness to our friends and family and anyone else in our lives. For in Jesus, we have everything we need, no matter what happens in this world. Lord God, we think now of everyone in our church who is facing various struggles with sickness and uncertainty about their future. We also think of those who are facing the grief of the loss of loved ones, such as Mark Bradley, who saw the passing of his dad this week. We pray for our church family as they face the reality of ill health and even death. Instead of despair, may they know your love and goodness to them in Jesus Christ. May they take comfort in you, knowing that Christ is Lord over everything. We also bring before you the current Big Questions campaign. Might we think about how we can take part in this, Give us courage to, proceed, to progress those relationships with friends with the same love that you show us. Lord, as we now turn to your word, we pray that you will be with Mike as he faithfully ministers to us. Enable us to hear and take in some important truths from the scriptures and to understand what the events of Exodus mean to us today. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. morning everyone. Uh, I'm Ken Zostra and I'll be reading God's word to us this morning. Uh, so if you'd like to grab your Bibles, um, open up to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6 will be uh, starting from verse 28 going into chapter 7 all the way through to uh, verse 13. Now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, Since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. The Lord said to, Mo to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs, yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Thank you, Ken. 
And good morning. Uh, good morning. How good is it to, to be here together? Um, I've been loving uh, seeing with you guys, hanging out with you guys. Uh, and good morning to everyone at home as well. Hope to see you guys if you're able to over the next couple of weeks. Uh, my name's Mike. If I haven't met you, I'm going to pray and ask for God's help for me and also for us this morning. So join with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you that we can uh, meet here this morning and gather. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your word that you speak to us through it. And as we open up this huge uh, section of your word, this epic story this morning, I pray that you would speak through me uh, and speak to our hearts this morning. Make us more like your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, have you ever been part of a battle that turned into this fail, this losing contest? Maybe it was a a, a team project at work that you weren't able to get to a deadline. Maybe you were part of a trivia team and just no one knew any of the right answers. Maybe it was a sporting battle. Maybe uh, it was even an esports battle where you were just getting owned. I remember a few years ago, uh, I used to play Aussie Rules, AFL, and uh, we played against uh, this team, the Bulldogs, right? The Bulldogs. And we were all pretty new. We were all learning how to play and stuff. And we played against this team. We rocked up, right? And we had two less people than them. So we didn't have any reserves, and we had two less on the field. <laughs> like, this is going to be a tough day. But we actually kicked the first couple of goals, and we were getting excited. But I was marking up against this guy who was about two meters tall. Like, I'm 190. He was a big guy, and he kicked over 10 goals on me. <laughs> and we got destroyed. We, they beat us by over 100 points. It was an epic, epic fail. We lost this big battle. Well, this morning, though, we're going to see a much bigger contest, right? A much more epic battle between two of the powerhouses of the ancient world. This has been the climax to a bunch of, of really awesome movies. Uh, hands up who's seen The Ten Commandments. Old school, yeah. Yeah, a bunch of you guys. What about, uh, what about The Prince of Egypt? Prince of Egypt, yeah, yep. Yeah. What about this epic movie, the Christ Central Kids Exodus production? Yeah, yeah. Look at that. It's been been a part of much of epic movies. Also, some maybe not so epic movies, Exodus, Gods and Kings. Don't recommend seeing that if you haven't. Um, but this movie, it's this uh, this story has been the, the heart of so many movies because it's such an incredible story. See, it's up against this guy, this king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, who was probably the most powerful king of the world around 1500 BC. But he's more than just an ancient king, right? See, in the Bible, Egypt actually represents the opposition towards God. The opposition towards God. He actually represents the king of the world. And so who is he up against? Well, he's up against the Lord God, the king of the, the, the God of the Hebrews, who, to be honest, though, had sort of been pretty quiet for 400 years uh, since the time of Joseph. He did make himself uh, known to Moses. We saw that last week through the burning bush. But apart from that, not much sort of obvious stuff had happened. And here's a question for us this morning. I want to ask you, are you part of God's team or are you part of the world's team? If you're a Christian here this morning, you might be thinking that's an easy question. Of course, I'm part of God's team. But what about when God is silent? What about when you pray and you don't see much happening. What about it when it looks like that those who aren't following God have life much better? If we look at the characters uh, in the story this morning, um, they're actually a bunch of flawed people who ignore God and think they know better for themselves. They're worried for their own concerns and safety, even those who are supposed to be on God's team. And so let's look at this patch this morning. Here's what we're going to do. I'm covering six chapters, right? So we're going to move through pretty quickly um, and we're going to see at the end two things about God and one thing about what it means to be on God's team all right so remember last week uh, if you if you know the story of Exodus we saw a reluctant leader emerge uh, called Moses right who made every excuse under the sun um, but God actually called him to uh, go and confront this king uh, Pharaoh and and let his people go uh, and so the king Pharaoh right he's powerful I mean, he's probably Ramses II. He's the greatest ruler of Egypt. He conquered a bunch of the Middle East, but he's also a tyrant. He's, he's had God's people in slave labor. He's trying to control the population, and he's even killing all the baby boys. You know, he's sort of an ancient equivalent to like a Joseph Stalin, or maybe even an Adolf Hitler. And in chapter 5, God, he commands Moses to confront Pharaoh, and, and he says he wants people to go so they can worship the Lord. And Pharaoh, he laughs this off. 
He's like, what do you mean, Lord? Who's this Lord? You see, in Egypt, they had many, many gods. But the Lord, He wasn't on their list. And see, Pharaoh, right? He was the mediator between all these powerful gods and the people. Pharaoh was the, the, the representative, God's representative on earth, sort of God in flesh, God in human form. He was the guy that was meant to be the spokesperson on behalf of the gods. In fact, people would worship him as God. And so Moses says, we're going to go and worship the Lord. He just thought that was ridiculous. And so what does he do? He makes things worse for the Israelites. See, they've been um, making bricks to kind of build pyramids and tombstones and things like that. They've been using straw. They've been given sort of straw rations to do that. But, but what Pharaoh does is he takes away the straw. He's like, go find your own straw. He makes it hard for these, harder for these guys, probably working 14-hour days, being whipped, beaten under the hot, scorching Egyptian sun. You know, it'd be sort of like telling someone to go mow the lawn, except they've got to use clippers or something like that. Like, it'd just be a ridiculous request. So they're going on, they're, they're getting under the pump. Moses goes back to God, and you can sort of, you know, empathize with him a bit. You know, God, you promised that things were going to be better, but now they're only worse. I mean, maybe that's been your experience as a Christian. Maybe you thought coming to know God, your life would get better, easier. Maybe you thought you'd have better friends, a better love life, better family, better situation at work, but actually things are getting worse. Well, how does God respond here? He actually points Moses away from himself and towards God. He says, do you remember last week how I spoke to you through that burning bush? Yeah, that was me. Watch what's going to happen next. This is going to be fun. So Moses, he goes back to Israel, and they don't listen. He goes back to his people. They've forgotten about God. So instead of praying, they were complaining, you know, grumbling. It's understandable. They were under pretty tough conditions. And Moses, he's not exactly oozing with confidence right now. He goes back to God and he's like, Israelites, they won't listen to me. So how can you expect this king, this evil king Pharaoh? He's not going to listen to me. He says, I speak with, un- with, un- with faltering lips. The people won't listen. Why would Pharaoh listen? God says, watch me and trust me. So what we're going to see this morning, 10 rounds, this epic battle of Pharaoh versus the Lord. All right, round one. God says to Moses, here's what I want you to do. Do you remember before in the wilderness how you got your stick and you threw it down and it became a snake? We're going to do that one again. So let's do that again. Moses and his brother Aaron, they go up to Pharaoh and they throw their sticks down and they become snakes as we saw in the kids' production. That's a pretty cool party trick. I'd be impressed. Pharaoh, not so much. He's like, we've got guys that can do that. So he goes and he... He calls his magicians, they come in and they get their sticks and they throw it. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. Their magicians turn their sticks into snakes. That, that's, that's kind of weird. I don't know if you've sort of heard that bit of the Bible. That you thought, that's a bit of a weird thing to do. What's this magic about? Well, you know, magic, spirituality, this stuff, skeptical, I think as Aussies, as Westerners, about all this stuff. But the Bible's pretty clear. There actually are real spiritual forces out there outside of God. And Pharaoh, he's like the leader of the spiritual opposition. And so he has real power. God is not the only one that can do miracles. But notice what happens. Uh, Chapter 7, verse 12. Aaron's stick, they swallow up the other sticks of the magicians. You know, just like the kids' movie, kind of eating the the jelly snakes, the killer pythons. You know, this would be be sort of pretty awkward for the magicians, right? They, you know, they probably got their, their, their sticks from the magic store or their boss. And they go back and they're like, where's your sticks? It was eaten. Eaten? What do you mean it was eaten? Yeah, it was eaten by a snake. (laughs) Kind of sounds like a bad homework excuse, right? (laughs) The snake ate it. I mean, like, what's what's going on here? Well, so Aaron, his stick ate the other sticks. What's the significance there? Well, this is the the first sign. Before we see the the kind of ten plagues, this is a little warm-up, an appetizer about what's going to happen next. See, the snake. The snake was a great symbol of power for Egypt. You know, if you've seen uh, pictures of of pharaohs, they've often got a little snake on their headdress. They worship the snake. Yes, there's real power in the world, but ultimately God is in control. And so God, he makes a mockery of the Egyptian power symbol, the snake. Round one, God versus Pharaoh. God wins. Verse 13 uh, tells us who's in control. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard. He still refused to listen just as the Lord predicted. 
All right, let's look at round two. See, God says, Pharaoh won't listen to that, so I'm going to do something else. I'm going to target something that's precious to you, the River Nile. The River Nile was the heartbeat of the Egyptian, uh, the, of the Egyptian economy. See, Egypt, you know, it's a desert nation. They relied very much on the Nile and the sort of the valley around there for their produce. Uh, animals would feed from there. They'd build houses and things like that there. But also, even more than that, the Nile was worshipped as a god. And so God, what does he do? He turns the Nile from a place of life into a place of death. He turns the water into blood. See, this is more than a physical battle. It's spiritual war. This blood, right? It stunk. I mean, let's be honest, right? We live in Brisbane. Our river, it's not, you know, kind of the, the number one thing to boast about, right? The great brown snake, we call it. But imagine if it turned to blood, right? Imagine if it turned to blood. Like, that would be pretty confronting, right? But even more than that, all the other pools, imagine Pine Rivers, you know, Warner Lakes, like all these kind of pockets, our swimming pool just turning to blood. That would be gross. But strangely, what happens then? Pharaoh's band of merry magicians, they, they come back and they do the same thing. They turn water into blood. It's kind of a weird, you sort of think um, Pharaoh would want them to do the opposite, maybe turn it back to water so they can have a drink again. I'm not sure what that's about, but that's not enough to convince Pharaoh. He does not listen. So round two, God versus Pharaoh. Maybe at best we call it a draw. Let's move on to round three a week later. God, he sends frogs. He sends frogs. You know, as Queenslanders, we, we kind of get this. Um, you know, we can relate to this plague. You know, whenever it rains, I sort of have a couple of cane toads in my backyard. That's pretty gross. But imagine seeing them inside your house. I don't know if you've seen that before. Imagine opening up your fridge and seeing them there in the crisper. Imagine pouring out your wheat bix and there's a frog there. Imagine waking up next to your bed in the pillow, next to your pillow in the bed, and there's a frog, or in the bath, in the shower. That's what's going on, right? And so Pharaoh, he, he asked the magicians, can they pull a frog out of their hat? They can't, right? But this time, Pharaoh, he can't handle it. He asked Moses to pray to get rid of these pesky frogs. And Moses, he does something quite clever. He says, hey, Pharaoh, all right, I'll pray, but when should I pray? Pharaoh says, all right, pray tomorrow, pray tomorrow, just get rid of these frogs. And so Moses prays the next day to get rid of these frogs. But what happens? Yeah, nah. As soon as things get better, as soon as Pharaoh can finally have that nice bath in peace, his heart becomes hardened and he does not let Israel go. Round three, God wins. Round four and five, I'll do them together. God continues to flex his muscles. But reality, he's just warming up. He's just getting started. And what we see here is gnats, or some, as some translations say, but I think mozzies is a, a better word. It's sort of the same original word, same kind of word in Hebrew. But um, God turns dust into mozzies, right? And they start biting people and animals. And having a few mozzies biting you in summer, that, that really sucks. But imagine having a full storm. I've never been in that situation before. Magicians, again, they rock up. They cannot... Uh, replicate the situation and they actually say that this must be the finger of God you know maybe um, maybe what happened you know Fer Ferry goes and he tries to panic buy all the arrow guard to get rid of the mozzies but that doesn't work he, so God says to Moses well if he's not going to let my people go then I'm actually going to send a plague of flies across Egypt in fact these flies are even going to enter the palace except they don't actually go to this place called Goshen where God's people are living. So everywhere in Egypt except for Goshen, millions and millions of flies come. And Pharaoh says, enough. Get rid of these flies. So Moses says, all right, I'll pray to God. I'll make it stop. But let us go and worship God in the wilderness. And what does Pharaoh say then? Pharaoh says, all right, fine, you can go. Just don't go too far. And he's sort of like that parent. All right, you can go and play, but just as long as I can still see you. I don't know if you've been in that situation before. But as soon as, as soon as the flies left, what happens? Pharaoh, he changes his mind, he closes the borders, and he doesn't let Israel go. Round five. Round six, things keep escalating. See, it's not just these annoying, creepy animals that come and make a nu nuisance. Things start dying. The Lord says to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, and if you won't let my people go, then I'm going to kill 
all the Egyptian farm animals, the livestock, the cows, horses, sheep, goats. I'll protect yours. And so what happens? Pharaoh says, nah. He says, no. And the animals die. In fact, even after Pharaoh realizes that the Egyptian animals are safe, the Bible says that Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He was that stubborn. These poor animals were dying, but he's power hungry and controlling. He's refusing to let God's people go. See, Pharaoh, he's getting badly beaten now. He's barely holding in. Let's move to round seven. Round seven boils. <laughs> well, I don't have a picture for this one. Maybe uh, you're thankful for that. But you, know, you can imagine it, right? Have you ever woken up uh, you know, one day and, and suddenly you've got that pimple on your forehead? Yeah. I'm in my 30s now. I feel like those days should be behind me, but unfortunately they're not. Well, what happens is far worse for the Egyptians. Boils. I had to look up what a boil is. It's kind of like a pimple mixed with a cyst that's infectious. It's filled with pus. It's gross. It's a gross word, pus. I actually had a, um, a cyst once that actually was in my neck. I can show you a photo of it later if you're interested. But it, was, uh, <laughs> it actually grew to about the size of my fist. It grew really quickly. It grew really quickly. And, um, and th- when the surgeon saw it, he's like, wow, can I like, take a few photos of that? <laughs> I want to like, use that in my next conference. <laughs> And when the surgeon like, wants to take photos of you, there's something up with you. But boils, they're worse than cysts. They're infectious. They're gross. And they're infecting all of the Egyptians and also their animals as well. And the magicians, they can't even show up this time because they're, they're just so grossed out by themselves. This infectious is everywhere. And so God, he's, he's completely obliterating, right? He's completely destroying the Egyptian spirit. But what happens? Pharaoh's heart is still hard. He doesn't let Israel go. Round eight. God says to Moses, if Pharaoh does not let my people go, he's going to see my full force now. See, right now, I could have easily destroyed Egypt. He's angry. He loves his people. He wants to set them free, but he's furious that Pharaoh has a stubborn heart. So God says, I'm going to send the worst hailstorm In the history of Egypt, I'm going to decimate the land. Everything that's still left that's staying outside will die unless it comes under the shelter. Even the trees will be stripped. I don't know uh, if you've been part of a a hailstorm before. We sort of get them sometimes here. At first, they're sort of fun. And maybe you'll get your your phone out and film it. But at some point, it can be pretty confronting, right? Especially when the, the stones get bigger and bigger. I remember uh, a few years ago when I lived in Sydney, there were hailstorms that were like as big as, as sort of small footies that were being pelted down. They smashed a few of my mates' cars. Homes got destroyed. There's nothing you can do but hide. Pharaoh, he's rightly scared. And so he begs to Moses. He says, this time I've sinned. The Lord is right and I and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord And for we've had enough thunder and hail, I'll let you go so that you don't have to stay here any longer. It seems pretty sincere here. He's confessing. He's asking for prayer. That seems like a sort of model repentance moment there. But Moses, he prays. The the hail stops. And what happens? Pharaoh's heart is hard, closes the borders, does not let his people go. Round nine, locusts. This time another storm comes, but it's not hail it's this cloud of insects, locusts that have been known to ravage um, everything in their path. And God warns us that locusts will cover the face of the ground. Chapter 10, verse 5, they'll devour every, uh, whatever little thing you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing on your fields. They'll fill your houses and, all, and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians. See, God is completely obliterating the Egyptian economy. Their livelihood, like the frogs have been invading their homes, but they're not just annoying, they're destroying. What happens? Well, again, it looks like Pharaoh is maybe changing his mind. Uh, he says, um, quickly summons Moses, uh, chapter 10, 20, uh, yeah, chapter 10, he quickly uh, summons Moses, and Aaron says, in verse 16, I've sinned against, sorry, Pharaoh says to Aaron, I've, I've sinned against the Lord, your God, and against you. Now forgive my sin once more and pray to the Lord your God to take this deadly plague away from me. And it sort of looks like genuine repentance there. He's asking for forgiveness, doing all the right things, ticking the right boxes. 
but God knows his heart. It's a fake confession. As soon as things get better for him, his heart is hardened. The locusts go away, and what happens? Yeah, nah. Pharaoh will not let God's people go. All right, last round. You're doing well. Darkness. God says to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky and darkness is going to cover all of Egypt. And so all of Egypt is dark for three days. Remember, this is a time before power. You couldn't even sort of use your iPhone as a torch. Three days of chaos. This is probably the most personal attack on Pharaoh. You know, he's been plundered. His country has been wiped. But actually, this is personal because, see, Pharaoh, as, God, as representative of the gods, the particular god uh, that, that Pharaoh represented was the god of the sun called Ray. And so people would worship Pharaoh as the sun god. He was the one that was meant to have the power over when the sun would rise and when the sun would fall. And so this is a personal attack for him. And God humiliates Pharaoh even more in verse 23 chapter 10 he said yet all the israelites had light in the places where they lived see god's people were living in light and egypt was in darkness it's dark everywhere but israel had light this is a bit of an echo of genesis 1 if you remember uh, genesis 1 3 god says let there be light out of chaos he creates this light god is in control right now pharaoh is angry and he, and he makes one last sort of bargaining plea. He says, all right, go and worship your God, but just leave your animals behind. I don't have any left. He knows he's defeated. It's a last-ditch effort to bargain with God. Moses sees through. Moses calls his bluff. And actually, he says, we need our animals because actually we're going to go and worship our God and we're going to sacrifice animals to God. So we need them. This ticks Pharaoh off. Maybe something's triggered in him because he realizes he's got nothing. He's got no animals left. Well, maybe it's that he's jealous that actually God is the one who's winning. God is the one who is getting worshipped, getting all the glory. So what happens? God hardens his heart. He doesn't let God's people go. In fact, he says to Moses, next time you come back, you're dead. All right, that's 10 rounds. God versus Pharaoh. Well, is that, what's the purpose of all this? You know, is all this stuff like a bit over the top? I mean, if God wanted to fulfill his purposes, couldn't he have just done one plague? Wouldn't that have been enough? Well, what God's doing is he's revealing himself to Egypt and Israel and even to us. And we're going to see three things. We're going to wrap up with these three things, two about God and one about us. God is powerful, firstly. See, God speaks. He speaks through an 80-year-old man, as we read, as Ken read this morning. Moses is an 80-year-old bloke, this timid guy, excuse-making guy, he speaks through him to do incredible things. And God is completely in control of nature here. But it's not just a, a natural physical war. It's a spiritual war. He's taking on Pharaoh, the greatest challenger to his throne, who was worshipped as God here on earth. And God, he makes a complete mockery of Pharaoh. He shows him to be a flippant, weak, pathetic man that he really is. So God is, all, is in control here in this situation. But for us today... God's in control. God's even in control of the coronavirus. I think we should be you know, slow to jump the conclusion that um, the coronavirus, COVID-19, is a plague from God that's kind of tied to a specific sin or country and try and line it up with dates in Revelation or things like that. We should be slow to do that. But at the same time, we should be slow to kind of explain it all away naturalistically, just by science and government policies and cultural analysis. No, no, we're actually part of a spiritual war and there isn't always a scientific explanation for everything. God is in control and somehow God is using COVID-19 as part of his plans, but probably not in the way that you or I expect. But also people, right? In the story, we see that God is powerful over people. You might have noticed that if we read the passage uh, this week in growth groups or at home, Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh's heart gets hardened by God. See, a bunch, of, a bunch of times will pop up on the screen. You know, God says in 7.3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. 9.12, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Go to Pharaoh, I have hardened his heart. See, six times in this passage, God is the one who's actually making Pharaoh stubborn. That seems pretty unfair, right? 
how can God hold Pharaoh responsible? Is he just this robot, this puppet? Well, actually, no, because we also see more to it. We also see Pharaoh hardening his own heart. In 8.15, Pharaoh saw there was relief. He hardened his heart. Verse 32, this time Pharaoh also hardened his heart. And there were times when it just said that his heart was hard. So what's going on here? God's hardening the heart. Pharaoh's hardening the heart. There's this fancy word uh, called dual agency. There's two agents, two forces at work. Who's responsible for Pharaoh saying no? Well, on the one hand, it's Pharaoh, but it's also God. See, both are responsible for hardening. Pharaoh was stubborn and God was in control. This is sort of hard, especially if we've kind of got a Western mind to kind of get our, our head around things. We like sort of um, process and we like you know, things like turning on the light, the light goes on. We, we like things to be you know, explainable. But let me sort of give you an illustration that sort of gets to this complexity. I want everyone, uh, everyone to lift up their hand. Everyone lift up their hand. And if you're at home, I can't see you, you can see me. Lift up your hand. Oh, good work, guys. Great. Okay, you can put your hands down now. All right, now let me ask you a question. Who was responsible then for lifting up your hand? Not rhetorical. Who was responsible? Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of things. See, you guys were responsible. I didn't like force you. I didn't have a gun to your head saying, lift up your hand. I just told you. You could have said no. Are you all compliant? Good work. But... But also, I was responsible as well. Like, I don't think any of you would have just randomly lift up your hand just then. See, there's, I was responsible. You were responsible. There's a couple of things going on there. But also, God was responsible because he's the one who's actually keeping you alive. He's, he's making your heart beat. He's responsible too. See, all throughout these chapters in Exodus, we see complexity. We see multiple forces at work. God is choosing to harden Pharaoh's heart, and he is hardened before God. What about for us now? It's complex, right? Who's responsible for our hearts towards God? If we don't trust God, if we don't become Christians, well, it's actually us and it's God. But it's not as though God is like a bouncer, right? It's not as though God's like Big Lukey, kind of standing at the door, not letting anyone into a party, right, or, or a club. No, God is not like that, right? In fact, it's the opposite. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, uh, he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and it you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So if you trust in Jesus, it means you have knocked, and he has opened the door. You don't need to worry about God hardening your heart. But God is in control. See, some people are like bread, and some people are like butter. You like bread, you like butter. Well, if you, if you leave butter, bread and butter out in the sun, especially in summer, right, it's gonna have, things are going to happen differently. So the bread, the bread will dry up and get hard, but the butter will melt. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, for some people, they'll be hard to it. But for others, the exact same thing, it'll melt their heart. It will change them. Are you bread or are you butter? God is in control and yet people are still responsible. So God is powerful, but secondly, God is judge. See, this passage, it's pretty confronting, yeah? It's far more than a cool kid's movie. I mean, imagine back then being a farmer in Egypt. I mean, it's been pretty tough a couple of years for farmers here. We've had the drought and bushfires and all that, and now, you know, COVID-19. But imagine back then, your animals dying, your drinking water becoming blood, your kids having boils. See, this doesn't really sit well with us. It makes us feel pretty uncomfortable. But that's, of course, presuming that everyone is innocent and that God does not really care about justice. But that's a wrong way of thinking. The Bible says that no one is innocent before Him, that God should destroy us all, but it's only by His love and grace that He keeps us alive. So this spiritual battle that we see between um, Pharaoh and the Egyptians and God and the Israelites, it's not this kind of battle between the good guys and the bad guys, right? It's not as though the Israelites are the good guys taking on the bad guys. No, no, no. This passage, it picks it up right um, at the start. Chapter 5, verse 3, um, God says, sorry, Aaron says to, to Pharaoh, we want to offer, offer sacrifices to our 
Lord our God, that he may strike us with plagues or the sword. See, God, he's prepared to deal blows even to his special people. Why? Because they're evil, they're sinful as well. God even is prepared to do it to Moses, um, we read about earlier. See, Moses, their leader, he grumbles, he argues before God, as do the rest of his people. And the Old Testament, if you've read much of the Old Testament, it's one big story about God's people stuffing up. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're no better. If you're honest with yourselves, do you even live up to your own standards that you set for yourself? Do you live up to the standards of your family? Have you ever disappointed yourself? How much more have you disappointed the God of the universe who knows every bit of your heart and even the reasons why you do good things? See, no one can stand up before God. He's holy and pure. He's perfectly just. And so this picture of judgment, right, this should terrify us because this is the fate of humanity. This is what it means to be in the presence of God and deal with His justice. And just this week, um, over dinner, I'm reading Revelation with my wife, and uh, I was reading Revelation 16, the last book of the Bible, and God paints this picture um, through this vision he gives John about what the final judgment will look like. And um, you know, if you read through the whole chapter this week, you actually see heaps of parallels between the Exodus story, the plagues. But in verse 21, I'll show you one verse. It says, From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 45 kilos, fell on people. This is the judgment of God. We should be smashed by these giant boulders of hail. However, that's not the whole story. See, this judgment of God, the Bible uses the word wrath. This wrath of God was poured out 1,500 years after Moses. There's another man who also grew up in Egypt. He grew up under a tyrant king who also wanted to kill baby boys. This man, he was perfectly innocent, and yet he took the full force of the vengeance of the plagues of God. This man, he had full control over nature, he could even control death itself, but he allowed himself to be killed. In fact, on the day he was killed, it set off another plague where the world went dark. I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus, he was crucified on the cross. He was perfectly innocent. The Bible said that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness. We might be right with God. See, in dying on the cross, Jesus becomes our hailstorm shelter. If we trust in him, he is the one that takes the blow of these 45 kilo boulders of hail. It's as though he's protecting us. The hailstorm is going to fall. But is it going to fall on you or is it going to fall on Jesus? Finally, for us, what does it mean to be on God's team? It means that God is to be worshipped. Do you remember why God wants to release his people? It's not just that he wants to keep his promises, though that's true. It's not just that he loves his people, though that's also true. Ultimately, it's because God is on about his glory. His glory. All throughout this passage, we see that God wants to release his people so that they might worship him. We see that six times. You know, in 7, 14, 8, 1, verse 20, verse 9, 9, chapter 1, uh, verse 1, verse 13, 10, 3. It's all on the screen there. God says, let my people go so that they may worship me. But it's, just, it's bigger than Israel. God doesn't just want Israel to worship him. God says to Moses uh, in 9.16 that I've raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. See, God is on about gathering a people for himself from the nations to worship his son, Jesus. This is the big story of the Bible. You know, it's kind of Matt and Garnett said earlier, this is what heaven will be like, so this is what we're doing now, worshiping Jesus. This is what we're made for. In the New Testament, I'll wrap up with this. In Philippians 2, turn to it if you've got your Bible. Philippians 2, we see three things where God's power, his judgment and worship come together. See, this is the whole purpose of Jesus coming into the world and dying. It's not about us. Yes, God loves us, but God did it to glorify His Son, Jesus. Philippians 2, verse 9, 
God says, therefore, so, uh, Paul says, Therefore God exalted him, that's Jesus, to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, when we die, we're all going to die one day, unless Jesus returns before, everyone is going to bend the knee to Jesus. If you're on God's team, it means that's what you've been doing already. You've been worshipping Jesus already. And that's going to be amazing. We're going to be seeing Jesus face to face. That's going to be incredible. How good would that be? But if we're not on God's team, everyone's still going to bend their knee to Jesus, but they're going to be forced in judgment to do it. It's going to be a horrible experience. They're going to have to suffer these plagues, the judgment of God. This is the fate of the world for all of those who don't worship Jesus. So are you a worshiper of Jesus? Do you love him? Are you thankful for him and what he's done in your life? What about like when you think of church, right? Now that we can gather together, we're sort of making decisions, should I come, should I not? Good to think about a bunch of things. But the main thing, are you thinking about coming so that you can worship Jesus? If the answer to these questions are no, maybe you're not on God's team. Maybe you're on the world's team. The world's team is impressive, it's seductive, it's powerful. But Jesus, He is the true victorious King. He has the victory. He's died on the cross to offer you a free pass to be part of His team. How about I pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the book of Exodus and thank you that you have shown us how you have defeated the powers of this world. And thank you that on the cross, uh, you ultimately disarmed these spiritual authorities and you've shown us what it is like to have victory over death. And Lord, I pray for us today. I pray that we would be part of your team, uh, that we would have a right view of you, that we would fear you and yet rejoice that Jesus has taken the bullet that we deserve. And help us to encourage each other to live lives that reflect uh, the spiritual reality of what you have done. And I pray all of this, in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, hey, we're going to sing now. Uh, no, this is, this is a, I love this song. Uh, we're going to sing a song uh, that actually gives us an opportunity uh, to respond um, to what God has done. And we're going to sing a song praising Jesus, praising His name, uh, because He has defeated death and He is the one that is to be to be worshipped. So if you're part of God's team, let's sing uh, in a big loud voice now and at home as well. Where is your
shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' Hey church, why don't we pray together? Father God, we do indeed praise your name this morning. We praise you for your power, for your might, for your salvation. We praise you most of all for the cross in which you have brought your redemption to us. And Father, we thank you for the chance to gather this morning to indeed worship you, to indeed uh, lift you up, to know that Lord Jesus reigns as a king over this universe. And Father, indeed, as we go out from today, may we continue to encourage each other to turn our eyes towards him, to know that he is indeed still in charge, even in the midst of our own circumstances right now. And Father, we might continue to praise and worship him in all of our lives. Amen. All right. Hey, grab a seat. So good to have you along with us this morning. Uh, You know, to to be able to gather here at 10.30... Uh, to be able to enjoy uh, being under God's Word, singing together. How good. Well, let's continue to meet over with morning tea just on the outside there. Uh, We do actually need to clear out reasonably quickly because we do have a start-up starting here uh, right after um, our gathering here this morning. But go ahead and enjoy that. Grab some tea, coffee, morning tea. Uh, Enjoy time out together there. Uh, We do have a great big uh, coffee machine out there, which is sadly not working since, uh, (laughs) you you know, if you walk through, kind of going, hey, I wouldn't mind a coffee from that. Uh, we're going to do a bit of work on that, hopefully get that up and running for next week. But hey, talking about next week, we do have our picnic on, our, our 10, 10, 30, 30 soccer match. Uh, but as actually as part of that, you know, we're going on to the Passover next week. We're actually going to be enjoying the Lord's Supper out there uh, in the outdoors as a chance for us all to gather together, um, of all, all of church together. So uh, another thing to be looking forward to as we do gather next week. But otherwise from uh, this morning, uh, that's it for us here. Uh, but thanks for joining us. Let's continue to go out there and encourage each other in the fellowship that we have in Christ together. All right, we'll see you outside.